one thing that I think really concerns me in terms of talent management is um, there's been a real big shift in terms of values where you have folks now that are coming into the workforce that have never really gotten really good structured feedback about where they are mm -hmm. and how good they are. This episode of Search With Purpose wouldn't be possible without my day job at Exige International. Exige is an executive search firm providing talent within the Western European market for a whole range of financial services organizations. We, as a group of executives at Exige, believe that recruitment can be done differently. It can be done in a way which serves the needs of both our clients and our candidates, and also the world in which we live. We've committed to not only finding the very best talent available in the world, but also to giving 10% of our search revenue to forest protection charities to ensure that the future generations have these treasures intact and can enjoy them just as we have. So if you'd like to find out more about our work here at Exige, then please do check out our website at exigeinternational.com. That's E-X-I-G-E international.com. Or of course, you can find me on LinkedIn and I'll be very happy to have a conversation. Guy, thank you very much for joining us here today on Search of Purpose. It's a great, uh, great joy to have you on. Um, I really appreciated the conversations we've had in the past. Um, so thank you for your contribution. Um, Guy, um, why don't you sort of introduce yourself quickly to the audience, a bit about your background and you know where you come from and what you're up to right now? Yeah, well, William, thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be here and uh, always a pleasure to speak with you. Um, you know, I'm a uh, technologist, right? I'm a technologist, technologist. So I've been uh, delving into the code since I was young, right? So when I was uh, a little kid, um, you know, this is a long time ago, my father was a professor at the university and my brother and I would take the time that my uh, dad had on the mainframes and we would actually punch card program in punch cards and we put all the punch cards when I was like 13, 14 in a wheelbarrow and we would go up. The only time we could get on the uh, mainframes was like at two in the morning when there weren't other jobs being run. And we would roll up to the um, university with these with these wheel, uh, wheelbarrow and we would basically then run all the punch cards through. We'd sit outside, the program would run and then everything would get printed out and then we would go through it. And then we would sit there and I would yell, oh, my God, you killed my red dragon. Because <laughs> we would basically, you know, we were programming Dungeons and Dragons games. Um, so, so you know, I've I've been at this a long time. I've got an affinity for technology. Um, I've got an affinity for developing product. I've got an affinity for what good looks like in terms of technology at at scale. Um, I've been a serial CTO. I've been in Europe a little more than ten years. Um, I've had global CTO roles. I've had, uh, I built my own startup, sold it to my largest customer, um, pioneered internet voting. Um, and then, you know, I've been really heavily involved in Europe, really heavily involved around payments. Um, find it very interesting, have built out a lot of technology in India. I know India really, really well. And then my most recent job that I came from, I was the, CTO for the connected company at BMW. Uh, I ran, you know, the BMW connected product, which was a mobile product for the connected to the car in 64 countries. And now I'm the CTO here at Tide here in the UK. And we, we have global ambitions. That's why I came and we're scaling up the business. And, you know, these are unprecedented times, particularly for financial services. And we're really rising to that occasion. And, um, 
really enjoying the challenge of scaling the business and really meeting the demands. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, if that makes any sense. Fantastic. That's absolutely great. Thank you very much for that introduction. And there's so many areas there I'd love to sort of, you know, kind of dive off into. So um, punch cards on mainframes. I mean, some people might be listening to this and have absolutely no idea what that means. I mean, the furthest back I can remember is with like an Atari and maybe with the loading in a tape and then and then moving on to the floppy, the sort of three and a half inch floppies and you know, loading multiple of those into computers to run games. But what's a punch card on a mainframe? Yeah, so, um, yeah, the you know, the, the history of computer science, I don't think we would necessarily want to talk about that. But <laughs> from my, I think what's interesting about it is, well, just to answer your question really directly. Come on, please. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I yeah, mean, yeah, let's yeah, geek out so, on it for a moment. Why not? Yeah. So the way it would work is back in the day, in order for you to, translate your uh, intentions in terms of the program into a syntax that the mainframe, the computer could read. Um, it was basic, a base version of a low level language called COBOL, right? That was invented by IBM. And the input for that language, uh, which was primarily back in the day was, you know, we're talking, you know, I was born in 1966. So, you know, in the mid seventies, uh, the way we would basically geek out on computers was predominantly mainframes, right? So you didn't have the PCs emerge, you know, from Microsoft and from Bill Gates and from Steve Jobs. That didn't really occur until a little bit later, right? And so um, if you were interested in programming and you were interested in inputs and outputs, which that's what we were interested in, my brother and I, we were interested in in that phenomenon. And so we developed and programmed this growth. So what you would do is you would literally will, you would take a, a card and it would have a bunch of basically zeros and ones on it and you would punch it. And that was the sequence for your program. And then you would stack these cards, right? And that was your program. And you would actually have to stack them in the exact order for the program to run. Hmm. And you would have hundreds of these cards, sometimes thousands. It was incredibly arduous uh, to make these programs run. But that was that was how it did. And and then the computer programming, this is really phenomenal to me. I think this is really interesting. It was non-distributed. In other words, the way you would access that mainframe, there was a there was a monitor, which was a green screen and a command line that you could basically talk to the mainframe and run programs on it. And and there was a terminal and you would basically load your cards, you would tell it, hey, this is the program and this is the user. And then it would basically load those cards through and then it would spit out your 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 program and it would do it on the screen and or it would do it on a printer. Right. Um, so that's that's where I got started. That was the first technology. Plus, you know, we were we were always building things. Right. So we built radios and we welded stuff and we uh, we tried to build a computer. We got uh, donated through my brother's high school. We got access to an old mainframe and we brought it home and. Uh, we fired it up in the basement. I mean, we were just uber geeks, right? In terms of, and my brother, interestingly enough, he was older than me, four years older, and he uh, later, became, you know, did, was a nuclear engineer in the U.S. Navy, running a nuclear reactor on the U.S. Nimitz, which is an aircraft carrier. So, you know, and he studied formally. He studied studied uh, mechanical engineering, and uh, you know, again, just a super geek, right? And so I had this advantage of having an older brother who was four years older who could really influence me, right? Yeah. Influence me. And, and, and that made me courageous, right? Because, you know, when you're 13 and you're working with your 17-year-old brother, right, that's, that's a pretty big leap, particularly when you're 13. And he just exposed me to a lot. And we were mm -hmm. just, and we were, we were also in a household, in a family context, William, where um, that type of uh, 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 discovery, or that type of innovation or that type of geeking out was completely supported, right? My parents were like, they just loved it. They just thought that was great because we were being productive and we were doing stuff that was interesting to us. Mm. And so they didn't, we, we had enabling parents, right? In terms of, and they fostered that, that kind of mentality. So I think that's also really critically, it was the, the situation, the context of the environment, the family environment was very open in that regards, mm. right? I think that is a beautiful point, actually. Um, and it's one I'm philosophically very interested in when it comes to the idea of creativity. And certainly from teaching children, I have three children myself. And 
um you mentioned D and i'm actually now a, a D and D player with my sons and ah, um sure. yeah we just started in lockdown um for the very reason i think you highlighted there is that there is an a creativity a intrinsic creativity to the game that has these wonderful feedback loops and um that, that are created for children that they can express themselves they can be creative they can learn the joy of creativity within a um within a methodology and a system and get the confidence to be creative uh, in an entire sort of world and landscape which they can dream up and they can have themselves i mean i'm i'm a video gamer generation and i see the the power of video games but i also see the the drawback of them and so i'm always trying to think of like what types of games i can offer up to my children that will, that will give them that sense of um creativity i mean you used a great word courageousness how they can be you know they can have courage in the process of making things so i, I wonder that's like I was going to ask and wonder how that's actually influenced you through the rest of your life and, and, and if that's been something that you think has been, you know, something that you bring forward into technology organizations as well. So, yeah, I'd just like to kind of maybe expand on that well, a little bit. Yeah. So, William, I, I, I think about this a lot. And um, as a kid, um, you know, basically being pushed to use uh, computer programming to solve problems in Dungeons and Dragons. I was I was really into um, being the ultimate uh, dungeon master, right? <laughs> and um, I, and I was really into it. So from the yeah. time I was probably uh, Dungeons and Dragons kind of came under my radar, probably when I was about ten, eleven. So you know you're talking mid seventies. Wow. And it, you know the, the the pamphlets were literally just coming out, and they were just the basic little pamphlets of what it was. And then we saw the, the first version come out of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and that was just a, just just a game changer. And so for those of you who don't, maybe we should just interject here because I think for those who maybe who are listening who don't know anything about Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> um, the Dungeon Master, or we now called a DM, is like the the creator, the narrator of the story, that the the referee, if you want, of yeah. the way that the story is kind of that it kind of holds the core narrative. But the players, who are the sort of player characters, then interact and direct the story, don't they? And he, he or she ultimately acts like a ringmaster, a narrative yeah. controller. Well, well, please, well, yeah. I, yeah, well, well, I think the context of Dungeons and Dragons, and I would love to see some data on this. I'd love to see some science. Mm. But I would suspect that there's a high correlation, super high correlation, between people who have or do play Dungeons and Dragons and work in technology and product. And also, I think there's an incredible parallel of Dungeons and Dragons as it relates to agile principles. Hmm. So the, the team itself, the players in, in Dungeons and Dragons, they're self-organizing. They can do whatever the hell they want, right? Hmm. Um, but it's the dungeon master who is the scrum master, is also the product owner, is also providing the vision and the narrative of the overall. They're providing the guardrails, so to speak, of what the team is doing. And the and they're pro and they're providing those, and they're basically creating the narrative as a storyteller. So I think that what's so important for me in terms of those lessons of Dungeons and Dragons is learning about storytelling and learning how to tell tell a story in a context of computers and information technology. I think is profoundly powerful, and you know, if, and and if you think about creativity and you think about innovation, William, right? Oftentimes, the biggest breakthroughs in terms of innovation, they come in the context of pressure. They come in the context of trying to solve a problem. But the innovation itself usually comes from an adjacent type activity that releases that creativity. Mm. So, and so for myself, in the context of Dungeons and Dragons, I don't play anymore. I would certainly love to. I'd you love should to do. To we should get a game I'd together. Love, there we go. Uh, I would, love, like, I would love to come down and, and, and geek out on the weekend over a game. I think that would be brilliantly fun. Um, uh, you know, that, that would be great. But I think that that narrative of, of Dungeons and Dragons and then in product development and in terms of product engineering, um, I think it's incredibly important. And let's be honest, as a leader, I do see myself as a dungeon master, right? Um, and mm. in, in, a very, in a very positive sense, because... What I'm trying to do for the organization is I'm trying to create those guardrails. I'm trying to create the structure. I'm trying to provide the vision and the mission for what the teams are doing. I want the teams to be autonomous. I want them to be 
powerful. I want them to have great capability and great skill so that they can accomplish that narrative, right? And um, I think as leaders, the ability to tell those stories and to talk about them in a way that people can relate to it is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, in the context of, you know, C-19 and what's going on now, it's even more important to really have that narrative and to have that discussion about what it is we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. Hmm. So I think that's really, really interesting. Yeah. You know what? I think this is, this is a point. Maybe we had no idea we'd be talking about Dungeons and Dragons today, but I had never, <laughs> never right quite considered in that way. And I think it's, um, the idea that in as a CTO or as a leader in an organization, you have to lay out a framework for the story that's being told the strategy, which is exactly what you do in, as a dungeon master, um, as a DM. And then what you find, which I, I'm seeing also with product, is that people then start interacting with the story in ways that you never thought they would. And yeah. you quickly start to understand what they really want from the story. And that may right. not be what you had thought it would be. Right. And, and that's also at the heart of what it is in creating modern day products, right? That we... Yeah. We, we start off with this idea that, yes, that's what we want. And then people are like, no, that's not how I want to use it. I want to go that way with it. And I think that is a that is a beautiful actual um, allegory for life in when you're playing as a DM, actually what that means in, in the real world and how you react to the, the way that people interact with you. So, right. yes, um, that is some data we probably have to find, actually, and whether or not it's... Um, yeah, I mean, I would be really fascinated by that. I mean, if you were to poll people in product engineering and see if there's a correlation there, I'd be really, really fascinated by that. I mean, now Dungeons and Dragons has been supplemented to a large extent by gaming itself, right? And I find gaming unto itself, good games, right, really do that narrative around storytelling and, and that facilitation, you know, mm. uh, I think that's really powerful. The yeah. other thing, the other thing that I think is really, and then I'll, we can kind of Bear, be done with this, but the, the, other, the other thing, William, that I think is really interesting about effective um, leadership is one lesson that I really learned from really good uh, and powerful uh, dungeon mastering was the concept of servant leadership. So the best dungeon masters, and the reason why as a kid, I mean, I literally, I, I, you know, I would be on a Saturday in my parents' dining room and there would be literally as many as 12, 14 people sitting around the table um, with me being the dungeon master, going through this narrative all day Saturday, people bringing food, everything else, right? And some of the people sitting at the table were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. <laughs> some of them were as young as 12, 13, 14 years old, right? Um, and the reason why was because I took, I was so into it, I would draw the maps, I would uh, do the figurines, um, I would do all this, but I would do it as a servant leader mm. to facilitate the narrative because I, and I would, I would, I would, you know, work on props. I would, my mother was in the theater, so I was able to raid the theater to have props and bring them in to tell the story. <laughs> um, and it was just incredibly, incredibly powerful. And what was so, you said something really nice about the, the concept of servant leadership. And this triggered me when you mentioned that the players themselves have a narrative. And good dungeon mastering, and I think good leadership, right, in terms of technology and product, requires you to unlock those superpowers of your team members. Mm. You can only unlock those superpowers, right? You can people can only level up, so to speak, and get their skills up and and become better in their their development framework. Is if if their goals can align with the organizational goals. And that convergence, that's the magic moment. When you can align that in terms of innovation, um, that's when you get great things happen. That's when sparks really fly, is when you can align those those development goals. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and and I think that's really cool. That's really, really interesting to me. Yeah, skilling up. And actually, this is there's a lot of parallels here. Because again, coming back to one of the reasons that I, I actually drew my children into to, to Dungeons & Dragons is that um, which sounds, you know, awfully, awfully kind of manipulative. But I wanted them to play that type of game because I, I saw them going into two, to video games where I didn't see the feedback loops as being actually particularly positive. 
And I think this is what we talk about as leaders is that we're trying to ultimately give as many highly relevant experiences to the people in our teams and the people in our organization so that they can improve. You know, I, I think about it in coaching when I'm doing when I'm coaching my under sevens football as well, is that I'm trying to get these little kids who are really motivated to come along to training as many relevant experiences as I can for them to build and become a better football player, soccer player in the US. But it's yeah. exactly the same case in the in the narratives of these games and also in organizations. We're trying to create these relevant experiences which they can be motivated at going at. And um, that's exactly the case in, in the games. And my children, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying to find motion, moments in, in these make-believe worlds where they can be negotiating, where they yeah. can be tackling problems and, and solving them, where they can be knowing when yeah. they need to retreat or when they need to attack. Um, they, right. yeah, yeah. And, and they can show up regularly and, and be motivated. So, and, and that's exactly the case that you just talked about, skilling up and, and being in organizations and leading that within organizations to get ultimately focused on the product and bringing them back to why they're doing it. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that relationship of those skills, skills of communication, skills of imagination, skills of kind of goal and value alignment, right? Because for that team to work well in Dungeons and Dragons, you've got to have that goal alignment. If you have one player yeah. who said, yeah, I want to, go and kill the red dragon. And then you've got another player that says, Hey, I want to go and befriend the red dragon and see if we can come to some kind of agreement that, that, that creates team conflict. And as a dungeon master, right, you have to learn the skill to basically let the team work that out, but you can use the narrative to basically reconcile that team conflict. So as an example, if you know that going, that the team's not ready to go kill the red dragon, you can insert something into the story that's a threat that's a little bit less severe so that the team is distracted by that. And that way, the person who wanted to go kill the Red Dragon, that's a goal, but that's a later goal, yeah. right? The team's not ready for that. Um, but what you've done is you, in, in the narrative, you've asserted something for the team to focus on as a goal, a near-term goal that's more in line with their skill set at that point in the narrative. Mm. And I think, I think that's so interesting. I, I'm, I'm also William, I, I, I've been practicing yoga, right? So I'm mm. a yogi and I really am struck by the metaphor of a daily practice of your professional career and that you're always improving. And it's, it's a concept of, you know, lean of continual, continual improvement that you can't just, um, arrive and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert at this. It's, it's, a, it's a lifelong journey associated with technology, code, understanding patterns, design patterns, all of that is, is, is in there. But I like to use the metaphor of yoga because I know as a practitioner of yoga that I can only do certain things. And I like to use that metaphor of the teams and with the organizational design we have at Tide, we use dojos. Dojos are areas of expertise where people can focus. So we have a dojo for machine learning and decisioning, right? We have a dojo for quality. We have a dojo for uh, services, right, for microservices that we build. We have a doje for clients and client UX. And these are communities of practice. And I like to use the metaphor of a dojo because if you ask a team to go to the middle of the room and all do free handstands, right, for five minutes, but that team has never done yoga before, <laughs> that team is going to fail. And they're going to have frustration at the task that you've asked them to do. Mm. And it's going to demotivate them. But if you ask that team, because they've never done yoga before, to do downward facing dog in the middle of the room, right, with a coach, and that you work on that goal over time for them to be able to do that free handstand, that to me is really interesting. And I think the dungeon mastering also lends itself to that awareness of the ability of the team. And so as a leader, you need to be conscious of that. You know, one of the things, William, that you and I often talk about is innovation. Well, you can't innovate, you know, if you don't have a team that's strong, if you don't have a team that can really do some advanced yoga, how do you expect you to innovate? Mm. And as a leader, you have to create the context, you have to create the environment, you have to create the culture, which allows people to up their skills and advance on that career path through some type of development framework that will allow them to grow. So that they 
can come together as a team and really do super cool things for the business. Right. And yeah. that, that, and that process is not like, Oh, you just do it. You tick a box and you've got it. You know, you have to develop that. You have to cultivate that within your culture. Right. And I think that's really, really important. And everyone always talks about Steve jobs, et cetera. But think about that culture of Apple in the early years, right? Or think about that culture at Microsoft in the early years. Or think of that culture at Google. Or think of, you know, extremely focused, extremely disciplined, but also with some incredibly talented teams that were at the top of their game, Mm. right? Uh, Extremely abilities to do extreme yoga. Steve Jobs could do amazing yoga, right? In terms of product, product development. I don't think any of us would doubt that. Yeah. Um, and he had the, also the ability to find talent and to create room and context for that talent to basically uh, do, do what needed to be done, right? So I think that's just fascinating to me. Yeah, I, I think you, you've touched on quite a few areas that I'm, I'm, I think are highly relevant here that we've talked about the, the idea of servant leadership, right? This idea that, that we need to as leaders kind of focus on the needs of the people in, in our organizations, not on necessarily what we are looking to achieve. Um, we talked a bit about coaching about, I think also that art of knowing what your team is capable of and when to push, when to let them fail, but when to support them enough so that they can win and go on and try again, right? We don't want to beat them down so much. And then, you know, you've, you've talked, I think also about, I suppose also making, having people understand in other ways about the concept of the challenge that they're facing. And I do, I do love this idea that we, you kind of maybe create these dojos of expertise. And I'd like to, to explore that a little bit more with you. Um, so the, do, the dojos that you talk about here, are these sort of led by specific people and they're sort of a repository of expertise a place where people can go and find out about machine learning about ai about a different top back cloud infrastructure just maybe tell us a bit about your your work with these dojos and why they're so yeah, effective so, yeah so let's i'll use the metaphor for our data dojo um and we have a an incredibly brilliant leader there named hendrick uh who is a very much a servant leader and that dojo is it's an organizational structure as well as a community of practice And it's enforced to basically radiate information about machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's also there to basically provide, extenuate APIs for self-service in terms of working against those technologies. And these type of concepts and these type of um, innovations or these type of patterns of installing them and building them out in companies, it's extremely difficult, right? Because what you want in terms of, I'm going to go back to the servant leadership. Um, I'm always struck by uh, Greenleaf, you know, Robert Greenleaf. He's one of the founders of kind of the servant leadership model. And I love his quote where he says, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? I love that. Right. Mm. I mean, I'll just say that again. Do those serve grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? To me, for to, to have a community of practice or to have a dojo like for data and machine learning, you need to ensure that the person leading that follows that and that they're aligned in those values to be open and to allow people the time and space to develop themselves so they can learn those things. And that they themselves is a collection of servant leaders. So it's like one good servant leader spawns five or six more servant leaders, and those servant leaders then spawn five or six. And that's how you get the cultural change. Additionally, I think this is really important, is there was a study done in 2002 by... um, uh, James Soros and another guy named Sanja, um, spelled S-E-N-D-J-A-Y-A. And what they found was that servant leadership was being practiced at an extremely high rate at the top technology companies in the world, product technology companies. 
And one of the values of servant leadership was really letting people, really removing obstacles and removing impediments for the team, which very much flowed into a cornerstone of the Agile movement, right? And the Agile Manifesto. So I don't think we would have had the Agile Manifesto if we hadn't had this concept of servant leadership or the servant as a leader. Um, it, it just wouldn't have happened. And that was published by you know, Greenleaf in 1970. So it was a very, very interesting um, kind of fundamental piece that really changed and influenced how management structures worked and what good practices were in terms of management um, that would really align well, that would allow you to get high performance. So I think that that's, that's extremely interesting. Um, Could you define for us as quickly what a servant leader is to you? Ah, that's really interesting. So um, definition. Um, I think, you know, there's, um, there's Don Frick's book, The Seven Pillars of Servant Leadership. And I think that that's really probably that's one of the better ones. I really, really love that. It's kind of it's it's age, but it's still relevant. Um, I think that. First and foremost, I think those are first people who are skilled communicators. They're compassionate collaborators. They use foresight. They're system thinkers and they exercise moral authority. So I think the best servant leaders lead by example and they can really, really encapsulate those things. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, you can also take that some pretty philosophical routes, right? You can look at, you know, if you wanted to expand it, expand that definition, you could talk about examples of like the Buddha, you could tell examples of like Christ. I mean, you, you can definitely go down those roads. And, and I think that those analogies and those um, parallels are direct, right? I think they're pretty direct. Um, mm -hmm. And I think those, you know, it's taking those big books, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, Martin Luther King. I think those at a kind of a meta level would be those ultra servant leaders. And then, of course, in the context of technology and product, I, for myself, I really try to live that moral authority. I really try to use foresight. I really try to use compassion. And I really try to communicate well. Um, and uh, I think the foresight in technology and product is extremely important because you have to be aware of trends, William. If, if, if you get the trends wrong, you're, you're just done. So like as an example, this is going to sound crazy, but there's a bunch of companies that are out there that are really struggling right now because they didn't get the trend around cloud. Mm. So look at the automotive industry. The automotive industry did not get on the bandwagon about cloud. Tesla did probably, but for the most part, and now they're playing catch up. And because of that catch up, it puts them at an extreme disadvantage, right? In terms of the ability to do that. And, you know, you can catch up with the right investment, but it's really hard. So you've got to have that foresight to get on the right trend uh, so that you can basically take that advantage of that wave, that innovation cycle, um, and follow that and basically drive that innovation into your company. Do you think it's a quality then in the individuals that, that stops them from getting on those waves? Is there, is it sort of, what, what do you see as the main reason why when it's so obvious that there's such opportunity that people don't, hmm. don't follow those trends when they see them? Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, you know, um, yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on that. So, um, so the, the first the first thing that I would talk about is uh, Conway's law, right? Um, I I'm not sure if you know Conway's law. Conway's law is basically it's stating that organization design systems that mirror their own communication structure, right? Um, so Con Melvin Conway said. Any organization that designs a system, and, and then in parentheses defined broadly, will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So if you 
as an example, William, if you think about Conway's law and then you think about cloud and getting on the right trend and your organizational design is a bunch of on-prem based compute mm. and you don't have organizational design that's basically cloud engineering, you can't make that change until you change that organizational structure within the company, right? The Conway's law is the law is based on reasoning that in order for so, for a software module to function, multiple authors must communicate frequently with each other, right? Yes. Therefore, right? Therefore, the software interface structure of a system will reflect the social boundaries of the organization that produced it, right? It's, and I think, yeah. yeah, I think that's pretty common sense, right? It does, yeah, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I, I wonder if, if I may, to that point, just to, to sort of cement on this, is that there's a there's an author called James Clear who wrote a book called Atomic Habits, um, and he talked about in habit forming that we we don't normally rise to the level of our goals; we fall to the level of our systems. And right. It seems like uh, maybe a, an apt sort of summary of what you're saying there, that this, the organizations ultimately may have a goal to move to the cloud, right? But if their systems are all based on hardware infrastructure, which are really hard to let go of, yep. that, that they're going to fall back to the level of their systems, not necessarily reach to the level of their goals. That's right. That's right. So, so think about it. You know, it's uh, in very, very simple terms. It means that the software or automated systems end up shaped like the organization structure mm. they are designed in or designed for, right? And I would suggest, I would say that in my experience, I've lived it, I totally believe Conway's law. Mm. You have to, you have to create the organizational design in order to get the innovation that you want. And I think that that point is really important. You have to create the organizational design to get the outcome that you want. So if you're an organization and you have in your organization a bunch of on-prem based compute and you wanna go to cloud, you can't ask the organization that is good at the on-prem compute. What you have to do is you've gotta carve out an agile digital speedboat, right? A little boat that will basically be focused 100% on cloud engineering. And then here's the controversy. Those people in that boat, they must understand and understand specifically how to do cloud engineering. So inherently, the people from the organization that's basically on-prem, they probably don't have the skills to move over. Now, maybe some of them can, right? Mm. But the fail, what most organizations do is they create that speedboat and then they fill it with talent, right, from the previous organization. <laughs> yeah. And, and William, you, 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 you deal with this all the time. You're talking to companies all the time saying, hey, we need to hire these people. We need to do this. We need to change. And they bring in, let's say, two or three really great players to change something within a company. But they don't give them the authority and the power and the permission to also change the people within the organization. Mm. They're asking them to do a headstand when they can't even do down dog, that, right? This that, is that's the, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I, I can understand that. And, you know, I, I, um, I think that's a lovely way to think about it. And I think the, the micro lessons of human behavior around habit forming, that, that to do, to change the way that we do anything takes quite a lot of effort it takes a lot of systems it takes a lot of change and time and when we're scaling that up to to multiple groups of people within major organizations you can see how it's the lessons are still very very relevant but but ultimately how much more difficult it can become so um i i'm hearing in here one of the qualities that i'm looking for in all of the people i search for and i mean the people that you mentioned earlier in the servant mo um, leadership model you know, people like Gandhi and such, they're all grounded in this, this real sense of humility. And humility is definitely the fundamental pillar I look for in candidates when I'm searching out for them, because I think it probably addresses so many of the topics that we're talking about here is this idea of when you've got to change, when the world as you see it no longer exists or is changing, that trend is changing that you talked about earlier. There is a moment where we have to subjugate our ego. We have to let go of what we used to know. 
and transform into something which is ultimately could be quite difficult. It could be quite fearful, right? Because we don't have lots of expertise and knowledge in that. But we know we have to change and it's the humility that can really allow us to move in that direction. So maybe that's a, a question for you then in terms of the way that you've seen organizations change. So you've you set your speedboat up, you've let go of some of the people who aren't able to make the change, some of them are, but how do you actually really embed that in an organization, Guy? How do you get an organization to change from legacy to new tech? Great, great question. And um, I think that, first of all, I think that it's really important. One, well, one of the key components is to really adhere to agile software development or agile product development principles. But uh, first, the first and foremost is we want to av avoid cargo cultism. So I don't know if you're familiar with this concept around I'm cargo. I'm, I'm loving the sound of it though. So please, um, yeah. Cargo so, so cultism. Cargo cultism it, it basically comes from uh, anthropologists who were studying kind of Stone Age based civilizations that were Stone Age prior to World War II. And then they became rapidly developed by the mid 50s. So as an example, as the United States basically occupied islands in the South Pacific, right, because of World War II, um, there were like Samoa, which was predominantly kind of extremely primitive. Mm. And then within a very short period of time, there were roads and cars and airports. And, and it literally means cargo cultism. So cargo flies in on an airplane. And suddenly people don't have the context or understanding of what that cargo is. So you saw in, in, in the or in the, those societies, you saw some very interesting developments, right? You saw people who, as an example, who were taught how to drive and they got a driver's license. And one of the first things they did is they drove the car into the ocean when they had when they got their car <laughs> because no one had told them in the training that they gave to that individual. Uh, it's not because they were, they were not smart. It's because they were not told you, cars don't drive on water. And if you grew up and you were Stone Age and suddenly you saw cars, you would see them kind of as these magical things. Yeah. And if you learn how to drive, then you're like thinking to yourself, hey, well, I'm just going to go drive it on the road. Maybe you haven't seen a car on the water, but you've seen a boat on the water. Mm. And in your mind, you might think a boat is a lot like a car and it might just be like that, right? And so you just drive it in the water. So that's one example. Or you saw the person who was told that in order to ride their bike, they needed to wear a helmet. And what they have on their helmet is they've got like a bucket on their helmet because they were told they needed a helmet. And they're like, oh yeah, this bucket is durable. I can't find my helmet. I'm just going to put this bucket on my head. <laughs> so, so those are examples of cargo cultism. And I think that the first thing about Kind of transformation within an organization so often within agile software development you see so much cargo cultism in terms of the practices and you see what i would call you know zombie based agile practices where people are doing the rituals but they really don't understand what the rituals are for right they really don't understand these a priori based concepts of servant leadership of the Agile Manifesto, right? And those principles in the manifesto to basically underpin a broad range of software development frameworks and utilizing Scrum and Kanban to basically do that. They don't understand what, what the history is there and why they're doing those things. Mm. I was fortunate, William, in that in my career development, I spent about seven, eight years at a company called Election Systems and Software which was the largest technology producer of election technology in the world. It was based in the US. And we pioneered internet voting. We did a lot of interesting things. But our software, it was mandatory, and this was in the late 90s, early 2000s, so you hadn't even, you know, you, you know the new models of uh, Agile and Scrum or whatever, those were just being, those were just emerging, right? Um, but what it forced us to do, because we had to adhere to like, five and six sigma in terms of errors and i'm talking you know one error in 10 million proven at the code level with code reviews and witness compiles all that through the federal government right 
it was extremely important that we developed lean practices. So we developed, I got exposed to kind of extreme programming and lean at a very formative age, which then led into agile, but gave me context and understanding of what the purpose is behind those agile frameworks. There's so often you see in organizations, they say, oh, we're doing agile to tick a box. Oh, we got our scrum certificate. We're doing agile. But it's such waste because you haven't done the cultural change. You haven't changed the mentality in order to basically get that innovation within the company. Right. Um, and I so, think that that's so, the, yeah, can I, so if I can yeah. recap here, just so I'm, I'm sure, because so cargo cultism, the idea is that that what happens is is the product or that the, the thing becomes more important than its purpose or its utility so the idea of how that can affect embedding changing culture is that really we need to think about why we're doing the things that we're doing what is the utility of them what is the purpose of them and how yeah. they're actually why they're being brought forward into the organization not just that cloud is the answer or api is the answer so let's just get a load yeah. of that stuff because otherwise as you've said we're going to fall back um, effectively to the sort of the, the communication system, the systems that we have that the organization has always had. So is that, is that an accurate understanding of this idea yeah, of Cogo Cogo, and then yeah, why so, these systems are what are important? Yeah, I would add to that, William, a, a couple, couple little caveats. One Please. is I think, u- utilizing the utility of it. I think that's really good. And that's really, really important. Also, you need to have, um, let, let's just be honest, agile, scrum, extreme, these methodologies are extremely expensive and they're really difficult. And we're, the, the whole technology and product landscape is littered with uh, projects and failures in terms of the success of those type of models, right? Mm. So it's really important to understand why they have failed. And the reason I think one of the most fundamental reasons why they have failed is one is lack of understanding of cargo, cargo cultism, which goes back to a base value of being able to raise your hand and saying, you know what, I don't understand this. You know what, I need expertise. You know what, I need to train myself on this. You know what, I need to read some books. You know what, I need to go and talk to this expert on this because I don't know what this is. And I need to go to those headwaters and I really need to understand. So I would say that you need you need to be a perpetual learner. You need to be inquisitive. You need to go and really want to go look for yourself and to investigate and go see, right? And go see for yourself and learn for yourself. You need to be that kid who had the wheelbarrow <laughs> going up to the mainframe at two in the morning, right? To basically program something because I was interested in that. My brother and I were interested in that. <laughs> and I think those prerequisites are fundamental. They're really essential in terms of the hiring, the talent that you have, the how you construct that team, it's so important that you put those ingredients together so that you can actually then pick out of the agile frameworks, you can pick the ones that are the right ones for you. Because let's be clear, right? There are so many (laughs) agile frameworks. I mean, you've got DevOps, you've got Lean, you've got Scrum, you've got Kanban, you've got MSF, you've got XP. I mean, and, and, you have to get on the same page and you need to pick the right framework and the right methodology and the supporting disciplines and the practices for the context of that journey of what you want the team to get through so you can hit and accomplish the goals of the organization. Hmm. So brilliant. And so I hear from this that the dojo component that you mentioned earlier is almost that enabler of information of new cultural change to take place because these, as you put it, these sort of these learners, these people who are intrinsically interested in and have humility enough to want to go out and learn can go to these centers of excellence where the change can take place and become embedded in the organization um, because there are these central areas, these dojos where they can learn. They can learn to have the skills, the confidence and the ability to then execute the new change, the new systems that they have, while at the same time, you're as the DM over at the top looking to set down the the tools and the methodologies and the culture, the story narrative that's going to best support that journey, right? Yeah, you got it. That's an excellent summary. And I think that that's, that's really 
kind of at the crux of what I do. And it's mm-hmm. also something that really fires me up. I get really excited. I mean, to be have an opportunity to learn, but even more, I get so much more satisfaction to see a team learn mm-hmm. and to see a team develop that that team goes from being able to do downward facing dog to being able to do, you know, some pretty advanced yoga and maybe even they can do a free handstand in the middle of the room for 40 seconds or 30 seconds. That, William, that is so satisfying. I think where I've gotten in my career, right, in in terms of the things that I've accomplished, I really try to focus my energy now on developing those around me and helping those around me accomplish the goals that they have in front of them. Because I know that as as somebody who came up through the ranks, I valued those leaders who stepped aside and took time to work with me and to coach me and to show me some nice yoga moves as I was developing. Those people were so instrumental in terms of helping me and developing me. I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, it's, it's Luke Homan, it's uh, Greg Hutchins, it's Craig Larman, it's uh, Jeff Sutherland. I mean, these folks literally took time out of their life to talk to me and to answer my questions and to help me to develop. And without those leaders, without those servant leaders having that influence on me, I wouldn't have accomplished what I need to accomplish. So now to continue that, I need to continue that. I need to give that back to develop that next generation and to develop those those folks so that we can continue this development and we can continue to get better. I agree with that. That's a, a wonderful statement. I don't know all of the na- names you mentioned. I certainly know Luke and what a kind and uh, considered guy he is. Um, he's certainly given me time, which he never needed to. <laughs> so right. yes, I could I could hear that. And I, and I must say, I think you know, hearing what you're saying about being a teacher, I, I mean, I'm starting to it's starting to rattle around in my mind now if there is a strong correlation between um, you know someone who likes to DM and their potential to go on and be a good leader <laughs> actually, and the <laughs> fact that you were leading 12 to 14 people. Anybody who gets a chance to DM will know how difficult that is at some point. Um, and that could be a great training ground for our children um, and a place oh, for them to learn these skills, I, right? Yeah, and, and and let's be clear, right? I think that you mentioned earlier one of the things that you, the reason, one of the reasons that you got your kids involved in Dungeons & Dragons was specifically because you were concerned that they were spending too much time in what I call the mono context. So those those echo chambers. So what happens in modern society, particularly through social media and with digitization, right? We create these echo chambers, and these echo chambers are fractured and very small. And you can get in you can get in these echo chambers in which it's self reinforcing, right? Let's be mm-hmm. clear. Mm-hmm. You know, face, Facebook. The reason why Facebook works is every time you get a like, it gives you a little bit of dopamine. And it hooks you into that context and it hooks you into a self-fulfilling echo chamber. It's Google basically through YouTube, basically sending you content that it knows you like, right? Which is really incredible technology, but it also is self-reinforcing because it's not sending you technology. It's not sending you videos that you will dislike. And, and I think that it's so important to learn those communication skills and also William, to develop the left brain and the right brain. It's not just enough to be really good at computation. It's not enough just to be heavily centered on just one side. We need people who are whole brain, right? They can, they can code, they can speak, they can talk in front of an audience. And, and we need to, I feel that we've drifted. We used to be much better at that. I think it was kind of an expectation when I was growing up that we would kind of develop these kind of whole people. We did speech. We we talked in front of people. Um, it was, and even though it was awkward for some people, it was important to develop those skills. Now yeah. we've we've kind of abandoned those expectations, and I think that in terms of technology and leadership, you know, we struggle with that. But what's so interesting is that if you open those opportunities up for people. They jump, they jump at them and they can, and you actually find out that they actually can be really quite good at some things that you didn't think that they were good at. Mm. So I think that's also really important. Yeah. I think you, you raised a couple of really beautiful points there. And, um, I, 
as you're talking, I'm I'm certainly thinking about the the qualities that I think of in a teacher, and that a teacher is all about creating as many relevant experiences for their for their students, getting them into these great feedback loops. And the systems that you've just talked about are great at creating feedback loops, but are those feedback loops positive? That's and, right. And and that's that's the real these are the micro lesson that we can see and the reason i chose you know to try and steer my children towards feedback loops which can have positive effects for them choosing games which can have positive outcomes um that is a joy and i think actually one thing i learned from luke Comans, and we both meant uh, mentioned here is his work with innovation games and the way he uses games and play to create these positive feedback loops when it comes to product development and product creation um it's a i think it's a real skill of a teacher um, to to be able to understand, okay, what does the student need? How do I keep them motivated? But how do I give them the right tasks that keep those relevant experiences, those feedback loops in place, multiplied by time continually? Um, I, I really like that thread that you're talking about. But you also mentioned something there, which will kind of lead us on to the next area, really, I suppose, which is the sort of the idea of the late, the next CTOs. What the, are the, you know, and, and what do the, the next generation of computer engineers need to be? And I, I would wonder, you know, about your thoughts around being product orientated and that, you know, how maybe technology departments have or have not drifted away from being very product focused. Mm -hmm. So maybe tell me about your thoughts about how technology departments and product departments, that could be sales, how you define that, should work together and how they can be super effective. Well, um, yeah, so that really, really good point. So I, I think that question goes back and I need to talk a little bit about why I came to Tide. Mm. So the CEO at Tide is a gentleman named Oliver Prill, a friend of mine, a really great guy. Um, yeah, I, just, I, I just love Oliver. I think he's an exceptionally talented leader, a visionary. And Oliver and I had this, you know, when I was going through the interview process, he talked about his philosophy about organizational design. And he was really specific, like, hey, look, I want autonomous business areas with guardrails and with common technology, but I want the autonomous areas to basically be agile speedboats that can really do what they need to do and make their own decisions and run their own budgets and everything else. That really aligned with my thinking about organizational design and what good looks like in terms of organizational design. And what what we're doing at Tide is we're really reinforcing that. And we're using the dojos, going back to that, William, to reinforce that and reinforce those principles. And I got to say, one thing that I think really concerns me in terms of talent management is um, there's been a real big shift in terms of values where you have folks now that are coming into the workforce that have never really gotten really good structured feedback about where they are mm -hmm. and how good they are. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll have people come in and I'll have folks who just, they've never gotten really good feedback about how good they are as an engineer. And we're really trying to do engineering excellence and it's not subjective, it's pretty objective and it's really good. And it, you know, we work with like, as an example, when we built out our market services architecture, we worked with one of the best. We worked with Chris Richardson. Chris Richardson is somebody who really has written the book on microservices. What did we do? We didn't just read Chris's book. We brought Chris in and he coached a team of about 14 people through, through two different sessions on what good looks like in terms of microservices so that these folks could actually understand it at a fundamental level and then scale that out within the company. And that investment, I think it's so important from this outside in perspective, and then also T-shaped, developing people in a T-shaped so that they're really powerful to basically give you that contribution. What I mean by T-shaped, William, is that they don't do just do one thing. They do a, a, a bunch of things. And I think that we as leaders, we need to expect that. We need to ask people to do more, right? And to have more skills and to have more broad application associated with what they're doing. And how they're doing. And is this how, because I, I've noted this about you, that this is how I think you, you talk quite uniquely about the way that technology, I mean, clearly, you know, your technology, but the way that technology interacts with the business and the way that it interacts and serves its, its clients. Because I think I've thought for some time that maybe 
computer engineers and in any technical discipline where maybe you want guys who are very binary or output focused or have a certain psychometric profile they've been excused for not having the people skills the communication right. skills the the focus on other parts they they're, they're the they're the actuaries they're the they're the they're the computer engineers they're the the scientists they don't need to think about what clients want they just need to get on with what they do um and, and is it actually now what you're talking about is actually trying to develop a holistic person you talk about the t-shaped person this person who can do many things or appreciate the job of many other people is that is that how we think then you you bridge that gap between the technical and and, and the needs of the customer ultimately yeah so you know it's interesting. So that, that's a incredibly uh, complex topic. And <laughs> um, I, 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 the, the book that I think about is written by a guy named Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink wrote a book in 2005, um, sorry, I think 2008, called A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. Um, and what he talks about is he talks about the necessity to have, you know, a new brain, a new kind of developed cognitive based brain thinking that basically complements left and right brains. I think that the pass that we give in particular heavy, you know, computer programmers, we say, oh, they're introverted or they're a little bit Oshbergery. <laughs> the research is really clear that if you have an expectation for them to stand in front of a group and give a compelling conversation and engage them like Obama, yeah, they don't have that skill set. But if you do give them the, the way to radiate their information and to do it in a way that is supportive of them, you will find that they actually can really radiate the information. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they need to write a white paper. Maybe they need to do like a podcast like this. Maybe they need to be in a forum with like five or six people talking to engage them. Maybe they need to do their interaction in front of a whiteboard to explain something that you can then video and then radiate in the organization. So the key is, the key is, is to find different techniques to unlock those powers and to radiate that information. It's also about expressing things in code and for us to be okay with code and not to be scared of code. We shouldn't be scared of APIs. We should be, we should be, as product engineers and as product folks, we should be willing to look at the APIs and to really get into them. Because at the end, William, they're nothing more, they're nothing more than a syntax. So this divide, this kind of what I call the river of nonsense, and I really call it the river of nonsense, <laughs> is the river of nonsense is this belief that coders and business people or coders and product people can't co-mingle and that they're separate tribes. I think the research is conclusive that the people who drain the river of nonsense and integrate those two things together using frameworks found in agile, right, as an example, have incredible success. Hmm. And I, I and I think it's myth making. I think it's, you know, some of the best CEOs that we have might have started as an engineer, right? They might have started as a coder. Some of the best coders we have actually might have started as a classical musician, right? Yeah. So so you need you also need, this is so important, you need also to just let go of your preconceived notions. Some of the best engineers that I've worked with didn't have a formal education in computer science, right, in technology. I myself, I didn't study computer science. And the reason why I didn't study computer science was because I would have had to do, at that time, mechanical engineering as a prerequisite, electrical engineering, sorry, for two years. I just didn't want to do that. So I ended up studying philosophy and math. Now, I didn't study metaphysics in philosophy. What I did is I studied actually the specifics around logic, right, that ended up being the formation of modern computer programming language. Like I studied as a, um, as a university senior, I studied Turing, right? Because it was Turing was a convergence of science and computers and also philosophy because he was really trying to build a machine to answer questions right in the Turing machine that was incredibly fascinating to me and i think we need to just kind of let go that we have these unconventional paths into technology and the reason why i think we have those unconventional paths is that it's so much easier to learn how to program right and i would encourage you william to 
definitely have your kids learn how to program. I think that's a great piece of advice, actually. And um, it's actually something we're, we're working on very much so. And, you know, I, I think you said some things that really resonate with me there. With, uh, you know, as a, as a headhunter, my day job is to find people. And, you know, I'm always saying that really, you know, you can get people with different a different suite of skills, but the values which underpin them, you kind of want to try and get those as, as uniform as possible. And for me, you know, people who have humility and integrity, um, those two are fundamental qualities because they, again, coming back to it, they allow you to have that mindset of openness, that servant leadership, learning, you know, be trustworthy. And, and it doesn't matter then if you're, you know, more on the sort of the spectrum as a programmer, if you can, if that person has a level of integrity and humility about themselves, they can absolutely go and communicate with that extrovert, gregarious salesperson. And they can talk together in a culture where, you know, understanding and learning together is absolutely what it's all about because nobody's bringing, they should, you know, hopefully not be bringing these huge egos to the party. That's a kind of utopian view, but there is there is a value in there that I think we can aim for to, to create teams that work together. And like you said, that river of nonsense, it's absolutely true. I think if you get smart people working together, me as I'm, I'm more of a sales guy, I'm not I'm not a programmer. I don't think maths is my, my expertise, but I do understand the foundational components of programming. And that, it, as you put, it's a syntax. It's a, you know, a, a set of words and systems which, which come together to create outputs. And that's an important element because I'm interested in it. But ultimately, you know, that, that interest in wanting to understand the other side, that's where I believe the value comes in. So the best CTOs are going to be product focused. The best product guys are going to be technology focused, particularly when they work in those organizations which have those two elements that are so fundamental to the success of their business. Right. Uh, so right. Um, I, I, that's something I'm really taking away from what you're saying. And I think that's great to hear somebody who has obviously learned all through their life the things that you have. Um, <clears throat> I think we could talk about so many things now, but I know I'm very time <laughs> aware of our time. Um, yes. I'd like just to finish up with a couple of quick fire questions, if I may. And uh, sure. you touched on it a bit, but if we could just talk a bit about well-being and resilience. And, you know, what what personal things do you have in your life? I mean, you mentioned yoga. Are there any other things that you do and that you advise your team that they do to to sort of, you know, keep the fire burning and and stay well. Yeah, so um, kind of daily kind of what I would call things that I do that really increase my personal well-being and happiness and make me tolerable to live with with my wife and <laughs> you know, with my family. Uh, uh, so um, th th there's several, right? So one is yoga. I do have a daily practice of yoga and I also have a daily practice of meditation. For me- What type of yoga? Sorry to interrupt you, what type of yoga? So, so basically, I do, I do a uh, vinyasa-based okay. based, based practice Brilliant. and um, uh, some hatha, but main, mainly basically a vinyasa base. Cool. And, it, and I really like the flow yoga. Mm. What I discovered was I was not able to properly meditate and calm my mind uh, without doing the yoga. So the yo doing the asanas and basically going through the forms of yoga allows me to calm down enough that then I can meditate. So it's a door that I have to go through. It's a room that I have to go through called yoga and the asanas to get to the room of meditation. Wonderful. I like that visual method. And then the meditation. Yeah. So what, what's yeah. your practice there? And the meditation is just a, uh, a daily reflection on mindlessness, right? Um, mindless, mind, mindfulness, but that's at the center of of that is basically trying to get your mind to stop chattering and to be present in the moment. Mm. And that is extremely difficult. <laughs> it's extremely difficult. Anybody who says that they're able to do sustained periods of time of being completely present minded and at the absence of thought for let's say five, 10 minutes, I, I, I got to meet that person because, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 because for me, it's it it was really humbling you talk about humility i mean it you know my brain is just simply so active it was you know maybe when i first started i could get two or three seconds of 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 my mindfulness right mm. um and now i can tell you all kinds of details like about the flat i live in in london and the noises that i hear 
and you know, you know the, the fan that runs in the bathroom exactly <laughs> that there's I, I think there's two fans and there's seven <laughs> screws on it and I can hear the screws you know, that, 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 that ability to get into the present moment and to think about that is kind of one of those doors that you need to go through on that meditation. And then that leads to some moments where you actually have an absence of thought. Mm. Um, and that's, those are really special moments. They don't happen often, right? Mm. That's a, that, those are real gifts, but just to have it happen a few times is enough to say, ah, oh, that's really special. And even though it's fleeting and very, very quick, it could just be 30 seconds or even a minute. Um, it's, it's really special and it's, and it's incredibly cleansing and clarity of thought and removing of stress. Right. Brilliant. Um, do you have and a, also, do you have and a, also, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, sorry. Sorry. I was sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to ask, do you have a, a recommendation of an app or a teacher or some, someone who's listening with that you, that you recommend for that? Yeah, I don't use an app and, um, I use, uh, I, I use a website called glow, uh, G L O.com. And it's, uh, it formerly was yoga glow. It's what I use for my yoga practice, but there's also a whole bunch of meditation uh, on there as well. And I, and I, there's about four or five of those teachers that I like, uh, Jason Crandall. I like his meditation because it's very clean and simple. Nice. Um, and, and I usually, you know, I usually shoot, I'm pretty modest, right? I'm, I'm just to be honest. I'm really modest. I shoot for a 15, 20, 30 minute window. And if I can get that in, um, I'm much happier person. Um, the other practice that I do that really impacts me in terms of a very positive way is eating correctly. So mm. um, I'm not a full vegan, but I try to, you know, 80% of my calories, I try to be, have those be plant-based and I avoid dairy completely. Um, and I do eat a little bit of meat, but I usually just do that once a week uh, as a kind of a special occasion so that the eating well and practicing the yoga and doing the meditation, those are kind of three pillars that I have of really keeping guys sane, right? And keeping me <laughs> and keeping me grounded and giving me emotional resilience to deal with where we are right now. Yeah, that's a really nice launch. And has the eating you found really just helped you be more present in the yoga and also in the meditation? Has that been the sort of the knock on effect from the eating? Has that sort of been a power source for you to, to do the other thing? Yeah. And, you know, it, a lot of things, you know, weight, um, just feeling good, um, you know, juicing. I don't know if you juiced, yeah. but, yeah. you know, making fresh juice and having that in the morning is just so exhilarating. It's such a great way to start the day. And I think it goes back to kind of your own personal good habits. So I think it's important that people find those good habits that move you towards happiness and not like a hedonist happiness but more of a happiness of contentment and contemplation and stability and calmness you need to work on those good habits and reinforce those and double down on those good habits it could be running right it could be you know riding your bike every day i mean there's so many things that work in that context i think it's important that you just simply mm. build those and, and have those good habits yeah very lovely i know I can, I'm, a, I'm an advocate, certainly back to your work on, I mean, yoga is something I did uh, many years ago and so it's still kind of part of my life. It's not a part of my daily practice in any way, shape or form, but I have a yoga mat behind me and I, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll do stretches and, and there's a sort of regular part of my day. Um, I, meditation is a, is a practice for me. It's a regular daily practice. I completely agree with you. You want to find, you want to try something difficult, just try 10 minutes of sitting quietly, silently with yourself trying to pay attention to the way that thoughts arise and um, not being just carried away on an ocean and a tide of thought um, it's um, it's incredibly humbling <laughs> just trying to go inside and do that work um, so great and I love the recommendation of glow I'm using Sam Harris's waking up app um, yeah and um, yeah and I, I like Sam Harris's podcast I mean he's a I, I don't keep current on him, but he's occasionally when I have some time, I might dip yeah. into one. Very interesting thinker on these topics. Yeah. And, and yeah. Then I, can, I can fully agree with your eating as well. That's fantastic. And um, it's a, a great lesson for many to learn. I've, I've been you kind of going off down a, a ketogenic route more recently and exploring that as a, a methodology over the last kind of six months. And that's, I think, changing my food, my food intake, the fuel that powers me every day has been a humongous change into my general well-being 
and my ability to focus and feel better about myself. So, and I, I'm using some fasting as well, but that's a, right. um, I think a great piece of advice. Those three pillars that you've outlined there are a great yeah. starting point. Um, I, um, I think we've kind of reached a time now where I'm, yeah. I just want to ask one final question, really just a couple, quick couple of quick fire questions. Um, what is your favorite book or any books that you recommend, Guy? It can be, can be anything in the world, top three books that you recommend, either business or enjoyment. I know you're a fan of sci-fi and some, some other topics. So, yeah, what would be your, your kind of three books you'd well, recommend? Yeah, so, um, you know, Neil Stephenson. Um, mm. uh, I just love his stuff. Um, you know, he, he recently, I think it came out a year ago, was the book called The Fall. Uh, which which is a novel about artificial intelligence. I, I think that's just so incredibly important. Also very interesting from a context of Conway's law that we were talking about earlier, that artificial intelligence will end up emulating the structure that created it, right? Yeah. So uh, I think that's really an important uh, thing, something to really get our heads around, right? Wonderful uh, author, one of my favorite authors. Yes, The Fall is fantastic, Seven Eves. Snow crashed on me. So yeah. many. What a what a great yeah. author. Yeah. Great yeah. recommendation. Yes. Yeah. So just just love love Stephenson, and um, a really great book on agile that I love is Jeff Sutherland's book called Scrum: The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. It's written for people that are are non technical, uh, that not in the field, and it's great storytelling. It's a it's a quick read. You know, I think you could probably get through it in just a couple hours. But I think it's one of the best recent books that I've read about uh, agile and agile methodologies and specifically the scrum with incredibly well documented and annotated in terms of the science that backs scrum. So, uh, you know, for anybody starting or thinking about agile practices or getting started, I would say start with that book. Start with The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. Wonderful. Great recommendation. And then, and then the other one that I would say that I've been – really enjoying lately is a graphic novel um and i, I bet your kids would love this it's, <laughs> it's called it's called my favorite thing is monsters and it's by emile ferris uh f-e-r-r-i-s and um it's just an incredibly beautifully illustrated incredible narrative about monsters and the metaphor of monsters because i love monsters so ever since i was a kid i've been a big fan of godzilla and so I've got a knack for graphic novels and, and fantasy. And that's something that's, that's, that I like in my life. And I, I like to keep that, that fire going. Fantastic. Well, what a great set of recommendations. Um, I think that brings us to uh, a great end. I mean, Guy, if anybody wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? Yeah, so I can be found on LinkedIn, right? Just you can go to Guy Duncan on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there. Um, also, and this is really important. It's a really important part of my story. And maybe we just need a follow up conversation for this. Mm. But um, I have a publishing company. Uh, it's called Gibraltar Editions. And we hand produce books with movable type in the tradition of Gutenberg with handmade type uh, paper and handmade binding. And I, that's something my father did. I've continued that tradition. So you can go to Gibraltar Editions and you can find out about what we're up to there. And we usually publish one or two titles a year of original works of poetry, William. Huh, and amazing. it's something that is, it gives me, you know, I'm, a, I'm the publisher. I've got a partner, Denise, who does all the topography and she does the book design and she's an incredible artist. Um, I help in terms of the editing. I help in terms of picking the talent that we use and we publish and I help promoting it. Um, but it's an incredible outlet for me because we, we create these permanent books, they are permanent works of art. And I find that in my job, it's a nice counterweight uh, because everything I do is so digital and so fleeting sometimes. It's nice to actually, you know, we're building castles in the sky. Mm -hmm. It's nice to produce something simple and contemplative. And, and so check out Gibraltar Editions. I think it's a, it's a, it's a gr great, great kind of banner for Guy. Oh, well, brilliant. As a bibliophile myself, um, that is a wonderful place to go and search out a bit more about you. And I did actually in, in the research see this and I'm, and I'm shame we didn't get a chance to talk about it in, in full detail. Uh, but two areas of, of definite interest to me are, are great physical books. There's nothing greater than the joy of holding a, a beautifully printed book of something that you really treasure. And um, poetry is actually an area that I'm fully exploring right now, uh, an area, a, a sort of a, a new form of writing that I 
at 38 I hadn't really explored at all yet so I'm great to see those two things together so it sounds like we have a whole host of conversation we could be having down that road um, yeah which is you know really really cool um I I would just like to say thank you so much for your time today guy you've um you know continued to sort of you know kind of share a lot of really interesting thoughts um there's a whole r range of books there that you've outlined through the course of the conversation which we'll share in the show notes so people can find those we'll have a link to your linkedin profile of course um they can where people can see you and get to know you a bit more but again i'd like to say thank you so much um, for your great wisdom and teaching and expertise here and um well until next time guy yeah william thank you so much and I look forward to hearing hearing the podcast okay absolutely thank you so much thank you cheers bye, bye.